actually. I'd like to share with you the major components of the ozone generator. Starting over here, we have the reactor cells, which come in various sizes. This is a 18 gram an hour cell. This is a 30 gram an hour cell. Over here, of course, is the oilless compressor. We have two versions of our power supply. This is our high output power supply. This is our low output power supply. This is the power supply controller. And over here, we have the oxygen concentrator. Really what I'd like to emphasize with this display is how modular our components are. Uh, simply with four screws, quite literally, and a wrench, we can remove the reactor cell. And the same basic tools are required for removing the compressor module, even the oxygen concentrator module. So maintenance is very easy to do with the ozone generator. These items are designed for very long life, but should one fail, you would simply take your spare unit, pull this out, install your spare unit in place, and then the failed unit would simply be sent back to Pacific Ozone for refurbishment. It would then be rebuilt to factory specifications and then shipped back to you to be put back on your shelf as a spare. This is an example of two of our ozone catalytic destruct devices. As you can see, they're made with the highest quality material. They're designed for ease of use. They're also designed for ease of maintenance. As you can see here, this has a sanitary coupling type connection, making removal and replacement very easy. It also has a sanitary coupling that allows the destruct to be dissembled for catalyst replacement. Uh, catalyst replacement on this takes only a couple of minutes because of this feature. This is an example of a smaller unit that has a half-inch threaded coupling instead of a sanitary coupling. Uh, all of our ozone destructs come with a heating element. Ozone destructs, of course, are used in environments where there's a little bit of water or moisture, such as an ozone contact system. The heating element is designed to boil off that water so that the catalyst does not become saturated with water and therefore lasts for many years. So despite the fact that these are designed for easy maintenance, maintenance is going to be extremely rare, if ever, in the life of these ozone destruct devices. Next, we're going to talk about the degassing requirements of the ozone contact skid. We already talked about the destructs and how important it is that the destructs do not see any liquid water, we do so with a degassing system that starts with a vent valve. And the vent valve is a very simple device that incorporates a float. Normally the tank is full and the float is forced to the top, thus closing the valve. But when gas that does not dissolve travels to the top of the tank, the float falls momentarily, causing the gas to expel under pressure. Because it's expelling under pressure, a little bit of water vapor will come out in the form of droplets. We then need a device to separate the water droplets. We do so with this system here. We call this an expansion chamber because what happens is as the water droplets exit the pipe at the top of the tank, they're still in train in a small pipe, which means the velocity is going to take those water droplets into the destruct if we don't incorporate this device that removes the water droplets from the entrained gas flow. What happens is the pipe sends the gas to the bottom. Water droplets are then removed as the gas velocity slows down, leaving the water to fall down into this drain valve. This drain valve allows the water to fall out the drain, but at the same time, forces the ozone gas to travel in its correct path, which is out this port, and then ultimately into the ozone destruct. At the heart of the ozone contact system is the injector. It's here where the gas ozone is dissolved into liquid ozone. We start with gas phase and we end up with aqueous phase. It's all done with this injector, or venturi. It works just like a carburetor. As water is forced in this direction, we create a low pressure at this point. That low pressure induces ozone gas into the injector. It's then dissolved with a form of hundreds or thousands of tiny bubbles and then forced into the tank where it continues to dissolve and then, of course, mix with the water in the tank. 
This injector incorporates two pressure gauges. These pressure gauges are important in that they allow us to validate the performance of the injector simply by looking at the pressure on each side and then looking at the injector table that goes along with this injector we can predict precisely how much suction is being drawn by this injector and that's important because these injectors are all sized specifically for the ozone generator that they are to work with. In putting those two together we get the perfect balance of the right size ozone generator with high performance in terms of mass transfer. In other words, getting the most ozone gas dissolved into liquid. It is important that we have gas traveling in one direction. In other words, we have gas traveling in this direction into the tank. We would never want the direction to reverse, which would, of course, mean that water would be traveling this way. It's because of that, we have incorporated a check valve. Now, there's actually two check valves here. One is integrated into the injector itself. The second one is a backup. But because we want to be absolutely sure that we never allow water to enter the ozone generator, we incorporate an anti-backflow valve here. And this valve works similarly to the vent valve in that it has a float. Should water make its way past the check valve, water would then fall into the base of this device. The device has a float in it. The float would then rise up and then allow the water to fall out, but never allowing the gas to escape. So we have a gas-tight system that prevents water from ever flooding the reactor, which would normally cause expensive failures in other ozone generators.